Hey there folks and welcome back. In this video, we're going to put our knowledge of Lagrange multipliers to use to solve the following example. Specifically, it's the example from our overview video. Here, we're looking for the global max and min of the function fxy equals y squared minus x squared. First, we're going to be looking along this elliptical constraint curve. x squared over 4 plus y squared equals 1. We're looking for the max and min along this red boundary. In part b, we're looking in the elliptical disk, x squared over 4 plus y squared is less than or equal to 1. So in b, we're not just looking along the boundary, we're also considering the interior. Okay, in part a, we're looking to optimize a function over this elliptical constraint curve. Hmm, optimizing a function subject to a constraint. Well, this is just screaming method of Lagrange. The function that we're trying to optimize is this guy, f of xy equals y squared minus x squared. And our constraint can be written as g of xy equals 1, where here g of xy is this expression here. So now that we've identified our functions f and g, how do we actually carry out the method of Lagrange? Well, at the end of the last video, I gave you a three-step breakdown for how this process works. And we're going to be following that breakdown quite closely. The first step is to locate any problematic points that lie on our constraint curve. These are points x, y that satisfy our equation g of x, y equals k, but where the gradient of g is equal to zero. Remember, I mentioned that global maxes and mins can occur at these points, but they won't get picked up by our Lagrange equation. Hmm, so I guess our first job here would be to find the gradient of g. The gradient vector, nabla g, is given by partial g by partial x, that's x over 2, and partial g by partial y, that's 2y. Now what would it mean for this vector to be equal to the zero vector? Well, our first component would have to be zero, so x would be zero, and our second component would have to be zero, so y would be zero. Ah, but hold on. If both x and y are 0, then this expression, x squared over 4 plus y squared, is really 0 squared over 4 plus 0 squared. It has a value of 0, not 1. But in order for our point to lie on the constraint curve, this expression must have a value of 1. So what do we conclude? There's no point on our constraint curve where the gradient of g is equal to 0. Okay, that's a good thing. We have no problematic points on our constraint curve. We can now move on to the meat of the problem, solving the Lagrange equation. All right, moving on to step two. We now have to find the extreme values of our function, f of x, y, subject to the constraint g of x, y equals 1. To do this, we solve our Lagrange equation. We find all x, y such that the gradient of f is a scalar multiple lambda of the gradient of g. Of course, we also have this equation to work with. The points x, y must lie on our constraint curve. So to start off, we're going to have to compute the gradient of f and g. Once again, this is our f, this is our g. So the gradient of f is going to be the partial with respect to x, that's minus 2x, and the partial with respect to y, that's 2y. On the right-hand side, we have lambda times the gradient of g. And on the last slide, we computed the gradient of g as x over 2, 2y. Finally, we have our third equation, x squared over 4 plus y squared equals 1. Okay, now if you unpack this vector equation, what we're really trying to solve here is this system of equations. Minus 2x equals lambda times x over 2, 2y equals lambda times 2y, and finally, x squared over 4 plus y squared equals 1. Maybe we'll label these equations as equation 1, equation 2, and equation 3. All right, so we have a system of three equations in three unknowns. We have to find all solutions to this system x, y. We could also find lambda, and often we end up finding it along the way, but lambda here isn't so important. It's the x and y values that we really care about. Oh, but how do you even solve a system like this? These equations look pretty nasty. Well, yeah, they're nonlinear equations. We have variables that are squared. We have variables that are multiplied together. In general, there's no algorithm that's going to work for you every time. They can be challenging to solve. The best way to get comfortable with them, though, is lots and lots of practice. My advice is to start with the simplest equation. In this case, probably equation 2. Extract any information you can from that equation and then start combining that with the other equations in your system. So let's give it a try. 
Looking at equation two, we have two y equals two lambda y. Now at this point, it's probably tempting to just cancel the y's, but don't do it. We don't know that y is non-zero, and so you might be losing solutions to your system if you cancel variables blindly. Instead of dividing, I always recommend factoring. So by moving everything to the left, we can factor a 2y. We get 2y times 1 minus lambda equals 0. And now you can see we have two possibilities. Either y is 0 or lambda is 1. We have to consider each possibility separately. First, what happens when y is 0? Using equation 3, I think we should be able to solve for x. If y is 0, then by 3, we get x squared over 4 plus 0 squared equals 1. Move that 4 to the other side, we get x squared equals 4, or equivalently, x equals plus or minus 2. Ah, great! We found two extreme values along the boundary, 2, 0, and minus 2, 0. But of course, we're not done. We haven't yet explored the possibility that lambda is equal to 1. If lambda is 1, well, then I think we should probably use our first equation. That's the only other equation that has a lambda in it. By 1, we have minus 2x equals x over 2. From here, it's not too hard to see that the only possibility for x is x equals 0. Well, once we know x, we can again use equation 3 to get y. By 3, we have 0 squared over 4 plus y squared equals 1. Therefore, y is plus or minus 1, and we get two more extreme points to add to our list, 0 minus 1 and 0, 1. For the last step of our problem, we're going to test the values of our function at each of these extreme points. In step 2, we found four extreme points of our function along this elliptical constraint curve. We know that these are the only possible locations for the global max or min subject to this constraint. So for the final step of our problem, we're simply going to plug these points in and take the largest and smallest values. When I plug in 2, 0 or minus 2, 0 to my function f, I'm going to get values of minus 4 each time. If instead I plug in 0, 1 or 0, minus 1, we're going to get values of 1. Ah, so it looks like we have two global maxima, each with a value of 1, that occur at 0, 1 and 0, minus 1. We also have two global minima. Both have value 4, and they occur at 2, 0 and minus 2, 0. I'd like to stop for a second and appreciate the beauty of this mathematics. Remember, in our overview video, I told you that the global max and min would occur at points where the level curves of f are just tangent to this constraint curve. Well, what are our level curves? If we set f of x, y equal to k, we get the equation y squared minus x squared equals k, which is the equation of a hyperbola. When k is positive, these hyperbolas open in the y direction. You can see that as we decrease the value of k, our hyperbolas are getting closer and closer to the origin until they're just tangent to the constraint curve at the points 0, 1 and 0, minus 1. These are the locations of our global maxima. Likewise, if k is negative, then our hyperbolas are opening in the x direction. As we slowly increase the value of k, our hyperbolas are moving toward the origin until they become just tangent to the constraint curve here, at the points plus or minus 2, 0. These are the locations of our global minima. Now, come on, you gotta admit, that's some pretty beautiful mathematics. We'll end this video with a quick look at part b. Here we're trying to find the global extrema of our function f of x, y in the elliptical disk x squared over 4 plus y squared is less than or equal to 1. So now we're not only considering the boundary, but also the interior of this ellipse. Ah, but don't worry, this is easy once we've finished part a. After all, if we're optimizing our function over this closed and bounded region, the possible locations for our global max and min are either at critical points inside or at extreme points along the boundary. The boundary is the hard part, but we tackled that in part A. The maximum value on the boundary is 1, the minimum value is minus 4. So now the only part of this problem that remains is investigating the critical points. Our critical points are obtained by taking the partial derivatives of f. We have that fx is minus 2x and fy is 2y. Well, clearly these partial derivatives exist everywhere, and the only place where they're both zero is at the origin. 
So the only other possible location for a global max or min is right here. But it turns out this is not going to be the case. If you plug in 0, 0, you'll see that f has a value of 0 there. So it's not a minimum. It has a smaller value at plus or minus 2, 0. And it's not a maximum. It has a larger value at 0, plus or minus 1. So even though we've allowed ourselves to take points inside the disk, the maximum still occurs at 0, plus or minus 1, and the minimum still occurs at plus or minus 2, 0.